A suggestion. You may want to take a quick quiz. The quiz goes like this. In your family, what was their reality on the following subjects? Smart Risky. 1. Job Security. 2. Building Businesses. 3. A Big House. 4. Apartment Houses. 5. Saving Money. 6. Investing Money. 7. The Rich are Greedy, Generous. Now you may want to take the same quiz based upon your reality. I ask that you take your family's position first because that reality can be a very strong emotional reality. After comparing your reality with your family's reality, you may understand some of the differences in reality between different members of the same family. In order to retire young and retire rich, I had to reject some of my own family's reality before I could adopt and find my own realities. For Kim and me to retire young and retire rich, we had to find ways to serve more and more people, rather than be paid more and serve fewer. Chapter 7. How to Work Less and Earn More If you want to get rich, said Rich Dad, don't ask for a raise. Instead of asking for a raise, begin to ask how you can serve more people. In fact, if you are serious about becoming rich, you don't really want a raise. If you get a raise, you are working for the wrong kind of money. In an earlier chapter, I shared how I retired early by increasing my debt rather than trying to get out of debt, which is what most people try to do. The logic behind that thinking is that there is good debt and bad debt, and most people are loaded down with bad debt. The same is true with income. Most people are not aware that there is good income and bad income, and most people do not become rich because they work hard for bad income. When you ask for a raise, you ask for an increase in bad income. If you want to retire young and retire rich, you need to work hard for the right kind of income. In earlier books I discussed the three different types of income, which are 1. Ordinary income. Ordinary earned income is you working for money. This income comes in the form of a paycheck. When you ask for a raise, bonus, overtime, commissions, or tips, you're asking for more of this type of income. 2. Portfolio income. Portfolio income is generally income from paper assets such as stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. A vast majority of all retirement accounts are based on future portfolio income. 3. Passive income. Passive income is generally income from real estate. It can also be royalty income from patents or for use of your intellectual property such as songs books, or other objects of intellectual value. Why Rich Dad Did Not Like Ordinary Income In Rich Dad's mind, the worst kind of income to work hard for was ordinary income. To him, it was the worst income for four main reasons. 1. It is the highest taxed income and it is the income with the fewest controls over how much you pay in taxes and when you pay your taxes. 2. You personally have to work for it and it takes up your valuable time. 3. There is very little leverage in ordinary income. The primary way most people increase their earned income is by working harder. 4. There is often no residual value for your work. In other words, you work, get paid and then have to work again to be paid again. To Rich Dad, there was very little leverage in working for ordinary income. Growing up, I always found it interesting that Rich Dad did not like ordinary income. He often said, the worst advice you can give your child is to go to school in order to get a high-paying job. The reason he said that was not because he was against school. He was against teaching your children to spend their lives working for ordinary income. Most people I knew dreamed of high-paying jobs with lots of ordinary income. As I said, the difference in realities was more than just different. It was exactly the opposite. Rich Dad said, teaching people to spend their lives working for ordinary income is like teaching someone to be a highly paid slave for life. Why Rich Dad Liked Passive Income Although he did receive all three types of income, if given the choice among the three, he would take passive income all the time. Why? Because it was the income he had to work the least for, it is often the least taxed, and it consistently earned him some of the highest returns over a long period of time. 
In other words, he worked hard for passive income because, in the long run, he worked less and less, served more and more people, and earned more and more the older he got. In my quest to retire young and retire rich, I had to know which type of money to work hard for. Kim and I were able to retire early because our plan had us working hard for passive income and not for ordinary income, which is what most people do. Another difference is that we planned on retiring with more passive income and not portfolio income, which is what most people plan to retire on. While most people do retire on portfolio income, it is not always the best income because it is the second highest taxed of the three incomes, and taxes are your largest single lifetime expense. This chapter shall explain why. My rich dad had all three types of income. The reason he had all three was because each type of income had different advantages and disadvantages. My poor dad worked hard for only one type of income. That difference between the two men made a big difference when measured over their working lifetimes. My dads worked hard for different kinds of money. My two dads did not work hard for the same kind of money. My poor dad said repeatedly, go to school so you can get a high paying job. My rich dad said, it is not how much you make that counts, but how much money you keep. He went on to say, ordinary income is the income that you work the hardest for and you are allowed to keep the least. Tax free money from 0% money. Another way of deferring taxes is by taking the depreciation from the improvements on your property. For example, Let's say I buy a $100,000 rental property. The land is valued at $20,000 and the building is valued at $80,000. The government allows me to depreciate the building and not pay taxes on the amount of that depreciation. Let's say the government allows me to take a 20-year depreciation schedule on the $80,000 improvement. In many ways, that offsets $4,000 of extra income I do not have to pay taxes on in that year. While $4,000 may not seem like a lot of money, when your portfolio is in the millions of dollars, that amount in depreciation, when combined with other losses that are not really losses, can be significant. One method the rich use to legally receive tax-free money is to simply keep deferring their real estate capital gains and then, at the end of their lives, roll that real estate into something like a charitable remainder trust. The moment they do that, they may never have to pay tax on all those capital gains or depreciation they deferred and used for much of their lives. It is due to these legal loopholes that so many rich people donate their mansions or other parts of their estate at the end of their lives. Their families have often become very wealthy through the deferral of the taxes on these assets they donate, and do not need the asset that made them rich anymore. They have made enough money to acquire other assets. Again, it does pay to be generous. Competent advice. The best advice is to seek competent advice. I am not a tax attorney, a tax accountant, or an estate attorney. These are highly specialized and complex areas of law that require the best advice you can find, especially if you are rich or plan on becoming rich. As Rich Dad often said, the most expensive advice you can receive is free advice. It is advice from your friends and relatives who are not rich and have no plans on becoming rich. Bad advice. Not only can you receive bad advice from friends and family, you can also receive bad advice from so-called professional financial advisors. Many people are advised that their home is their best tax deduction. In my opinion, that advice falls under the category of bad advice. In America, for every dollar you pay in interest, the government allows you approximately a 30% tax deduction. That means, if you give the government a dollar, it will allow you to save 30 cents. If that makes sense to you, send me a dollar and I will send you back 50 cents. Another minor point most advisors do not tell you is that after you exceed a higher level of ordinary income, you begin to lose that interest tax deduction on your house. That is another reason not to work hard for ordinary income and buy a big house for its tax advantages. The best loophole of all. In the previous chapter, I wrote about the differences between what some people thought was smart and other people thought was risky. In my first example, I stated that my poor dad thought that job security was smart and that building a business was risky. 
My rich dad saw it exactly the opposite. Rich dad said, if you work for job security, you will earn less and less the more you work. To me, that is too high a price to pay for a little bit of security. Today, as it was when I was a kid, the best way to earn more and work less is via owning your own business. It continues to be the best loophole in the world. One reason to start your own business is that you can spend first and then be taxed on the balance left over. Employee business owner. Earns earns pays taxes spends. Spends what is left pays taxes on what is left an employee today pays for many of life's finer things with after tax dollars. For example, most employees have to pay for their car with after tax dollars. A business owner is allowed to pay for his or her car with before tax dollars if it is used for business and meets certain requirements. When you are working for 50% money, your car can be far more expensive than your boss's car, even though your car costs less. Even such things as football tickets, trips, dinners, daycare for your kids, and other benefits can often be purchased by a business owner with before tax dollars. A business owner can pay for those things with before tax dollars while an employee pays for them with after tax dollars. They must qualify as legitimate business expenses and may be subject to limitations. So not only are most people working for 50% money, in America, most people are paying more for the working for free. In Rich Dad Poor Dad, I told a story of my rich dad taking away my 10 cents per hour salary and asking me to work for free. Many people think it is an interesting story, but working for free is not a part of their reality. I would like to leave you with this thought. If you want to work for tax-deferred or tax-free money, it does mean working for free in most instances. Money that comes from compensated labor is the highest tax of all incomes. That is why I often cringe when I meet bright young people in school who are excited about soon getting a high-paying job. A young person with that mindset or that reality is a person who winds up working harder and harder for 50% money. One day they wake up at age 40 with their high-paying job and begin to wonder why some of their friends have passed them by financially. The reason hard-working employees get passed by financially later in life is because they worked hard for ordinary income. They worked hard for pay raises and bonuses. Even though my poor dad started out earning more ordinary income than my rich dad, my rich dad eventually passed and surpassed my poor dad's earning potential. My rich dad said, you will invest time regardless if you work for ordinary, portfolio, or passive income. The trouble with working for ordinary income is that you have to keep working hard for it. Eventually a person working for portfolio and passive income will pass the earning potential of ordinary income because you can work less, earn more, and pay less and less in taxes when you work for portfolio and passive income. The reason for this is explained here. Ordinary income 50% money portfolio income 20% money passive income 0% money. My poor dad was passed by my rich dad simply because ordinary income is often income from labor. The other two incomes are income from assets. As time went on, my rich dad slowly but surely kept increasing the number and size of the assets he had working for him. My poor dad only knew how to personally work harder and harder for more and more, 50% money. People in the E quadrant have the least control over their taxes and pay the most in taxes, even after they retire. If your income today comes from the E quadrant, you may want to consider doing something to earn income from other quadrants. The S quadrant has a few more advantages over the E quadrant, the main one being the ability to deduct some expenses from your gross income prior to being taxed. The problem with both the E and the S quadrants is that the leverage factor of personal labor is minimal and the taxes are higher. The quadrants with the most control over taxes, the highest leverage potential for labor-free income, and the most legal tax advantages are the B and I quadrants. If you are serious about retiring young and retiring rich, you may want to consider working for free. The moment you ask yourself the question, how can I become rich by working for free? You begin to push your mind into another reality. If nothing comes to your mind on how you can get rich by working for free, 
Keep pushing your reality or begin investing some time and education into studying the lives of people who became rich in the B and the I quadrants. My rich dad said, it is hard to become rich working for money. If you want to become really rich, learn how to build, buy, or create assets. He also said, working hard for pay raises is very risky. It is risky because people often get deeper into the rat race of life working for pay raises. Also, other people get ahead financially faster than you. Many of the very rich became rich in their spare time. So, if you have a job because you have financial responsibilities, keep your job but make better use of your spare time. When your friends play golf or go fishing or watch sports on TV, you can be starting your part-time business. Hewlett Packard was started in a garage, as was Ford Motor Company. Keep in mind that today you can go from poor to rich faster than ever before. Michael Dell went from college kid to billionaire in three years. While his classmates were doing their homework or drinking beer at parties, he was building a billion-dollar business in his dormitory room. Most of his classmates, now in their 30s, are working hard for 50% money. Many are now going back to school in hopes of getting a promotion and a raise, and are still drinking beer and watching sports on TV. They may have a big house, an SUV, kids in private school, and are hoping their 401k will have enough money in it when they retire. Some are silently wondering how Michael Dell, a college dropout, got so lucky. His luck began with a difference in reality, a willingness to study, but not study for grades, and a willingness to work for free. The reason Kim and I retired early was because we worked hard to build businesses and buy real estate. That plan allowed us to work less and less and earn more and more. We did not work for money. We worked hard to build, buy, or create assets, as my rich dad had advised. We were not interested in high-paying jobs or pay raises. We were not interested in working at a job without much leverage and working for money that had its leverage reduced by 50%. To us that was not smart and, in the long run, it was much more risky. In later chapters, I will go into how you can work to acquire more assets with less risk and higher financial yields. Yet I warn you that you may need to study and work for free in order to learn how to acquire such assets. I warn you now because studying and working for free are things that very few people do. That is why there are so very few people who retire young and retire rich. I am not against paying taxes. Tax is an expense of living in a civilized society. Without taxes, we would not have police, firemen, teachers, sanitation workers, courts, roads, traffic lights, and of course politicians. The point of this chapter is to learn the legal and intelligent control over how much you pay in taxes and when you pay them. A suggestion, list how much you currently earn a month in the following types of income. 1. Ordinary income dollar, blank. 2. Passive income dollar, blank. 3. Portfolio income dollar, blank. If you want to retire, you will need passive and portfolio income, in most cases. The sooner you learn to acquire passive and portfolio income, the sooner you are on your way to retiring young and retiring rich. Not only will you be able to retire earlier, but you may also feel more financially secure. You may also feel smarter, since you will be earning 20% or even tax-deferred income, rather than 50% income, which is the type of income most people are working so hard for. The final sections of this book will go into ways to acquire more portfolio and passive income with greater safety and higher returns. But again, it may require more study and working for free before you receive those types of income. It often takes dedicated study and working for free to go into another reality. If you should decide to embark upon this journey to acquire the better leveraged incomes, always remember the Wright brothers. They are prime examples of people who studied because they wanted to learn and not for grades. They worked hard for free without guarantees, took risks intelligently, and pushed themselves and the world into another reality. Chapter 8. The Fastest Way to Get Rich Soon after publishing Rich Kid Smart Kid, the fourth book in the Rich Dad series, a review of the book appeared in a prominent newspaper. Almost all of the media reporting on the Rich Dad series has been extremely favorable. 
They have been more than fair, as well as objective, in their reviews of my books. This particular newspaper article on Rich Kid Smart Kid did not start out the same way. This journalist began the review with an attack on my inability to write. He more or less said that I needed to go back to school and take writing lessons. The irony is that I openly disclose in the book that I failed high school English twice because of my inability to write. Being labeled stupid and a failure at the age of 15 because I was a poor writer was a very painful event in my life. Since then I never have claimed to be a writer. Writing could be my weakest skill and the reason I had such a tough time in school. The fourth book in the Rich Dad series is about how I overcame my inability to read and write and still graduate from college. Rich Kid Smart Kid is about finding and developing your child's unique genius, as well as the need to develop their financial survival skills. So the journalist's critique was not on content, but on my writing skills, the same problem I had all through school. The journalist ended the review by throwing out one comment he thought was favorable and would make the article balanced and objective. He wrote, this book will help your child be more employable. Now, I found the criticism of my writing skills justified. But to put in his article that my book's only socially redeeming factor was that it made your child more employable was so far off the mark that I became offended. I doubted if the reporter had even read the book. Rich Kid Smart Kid is not about making your child more employable. It is about making your child more unemployable. If you want to retire young and retire rich, you need to think about how to become less employable, not more employable. Again, the difference is found in mental realities. How to become unemployable. In summarizing the importance of mental leverage, I restate that your reality is simply what you think is real. Or as commonly stated, your perception is your reality. When asked, is it hard to change one's reality? I reply with, it depends. For me, it was a personal struggle to shed my poor dad's reality of what he thought was the smart thing to do and adopt my rich dad's ideas on what he thought was smart. In many ways, changing one's reality from a middle class or poor reality to a rich reality may be like learning to eat with your left hand after you have spent years eating with your right. While it is not hard to do and anyone can do it if they persevere, it may not be the easiest thing to do either. The fastest way to become rich is to change your realities faster. That may be easier said than done for most people, because I have observed that most would rather remain within the comfort of their realities, even if it is a reality of financial struggle and constriction. Rich Dad said, most people would rather live within their means than expand their means. He believed most people would rather be comfortable working hard all their lives than be uncomfortable for a few years working hard at changing their realities, and taking the rest of their lives off. Using the metaphor of switching from right hand to left hand, most people would rather be poor eating with their right hand than become rich by learning to eat with their left hand. In many ways, that is what a change in mental reality requires. Content versus Context In an article entitled, Learning 101, in Fast Company magazine, we read, Learning is the single most important tool for people, teams, and companies that want to get fast and stay fast. In the new economy, in the old economy, content was king. In the new economy, context is king. In other words, learning to shift from right hand to left hand dominance is more important than what kind of fork is being used. The current school system still struggles with giving kids better content rather than looking at how the information age has changed the context of the world we now live in. Just as the book reviewer described earlier felt the only socially redeemable point of my book was to make your child more employable, most school teachers are trying to create course content that will hopefully make your child more employable. That is why the school system continues to focus on content rather than context. The context of the world has changed. When my mom and dad were growing up in the Great Depression, the context was that jobs were scarce and job security was king. That is why my mom and dad stressed the importance of good grades and a secure job. In my parents' day, if you found a secure job with a good company, and you were loyal and hardworking, you were set for life. The company was responsible for your financial security after you retired. Today, 
Most people realize that the context or the rules of employment have been changed forever. Content, context, and capacity. Although my rich dad did not use the words content and context very often, choosing instead to use the word reality, he did use the word capacity regularly. He would say, not only does a poor person have a poor reality, having a poor reality means that person has very little capacity to allow money to stay with them. He meant that when people say such things as, I'll never be rich, I can't afford it, or, investing is risky, it diminishes their capacity to be rich. He said, when a person with a poor or middle class reality suddenly comes into money, they often do not have the mental and emotional capacity to handle the sudden abundance of money, so the money overflows and runs away. That's why you so often hear people say, money just slips through my fingers. Or, no matter how much I make, I'm short of money at the end of the month. Or, I'll invest when I have some extra money. Occasionally I will use the example Rich Dad used to drive his message on context home to his son and me. Rich Dad would take an empty water glass and then pour water from a full and large pitcher into the water glass. It would not be long before the water would overflow the smaller water glass and would continue to overflow as long as he poured. Rich Dad would say, there is plenty of money in the world. If you want to be rich, you need to first expand your reality context in order to hold on to your share of that abundance. I use this same graphic example to explain the relationship among content, context, and capacity. I first start pouring water in a one-ounce jigger, then a small water glass, and then a larger water glass. It is a simple demonstration to illustrate the differences in capacity to hold on to money between the poor, middle class, and rich. How to expand your capacity. When asked, how do I begin to expand my reality or context? I reply with, by watching your ideas. I also remind people of one of Rich Dad's favorite sayings, money is just an idea. I answer by imparting the same advice my rich dad passed on to me. He pointed out statements such as, I can't afford it. I can't do that. That's wrong. I already know that. I tried that once and it did not work. That's impossible. It will never work. You can't do that. That's illegal. That's too hard to do. I'm right and you're wrong. Rich dad said, Cynics and fools are twins on opposite sides of reality and possibility. He went on to say, fools will believe any far-fetched scheme, and a cynic will criticize anything outside their reality. He finished his explanation by saying, a cynic's reality does not let anything new in, and a fool's reality does not have the ability to keep foolish ideas out. If you want to be abundant and rich, you need to have an open mind, a flexible reality, and the skills to turn new ideas into real and profitable ventures. Requoting the statement from Fast Company magazine, in the old economy, content was king. In the new economy, context is king. My rich dad would have said it this way, if you want a faster way to get rich, you need to have a mind open to new ideas and have the skills to take on possibilities greater than your current abilities. In order to do that, you must have a reality that can change, expand, and grow quickly. To try and get rich with a poor person's reality or a reality that comes from lack and limitation is a mission impossible. Why not get rich? Sitting on the mountain in British Columbia in 1985, Kim, my friend Larry, and I decided that we were willing to be very uncomfortable and push ourselves into new realities in order to retire young and retire rich. Believe me, at times it was very uncomfortable. When I am asked how we got rich and retired young, I simply say, we kept changing our realities. When asked how to change one's reality, I simply quote Robert Kennedy's famous saying. Some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? It is a matter of going beyond the comfort of your current realities and into the realm of new possibilities for your life. As Robert Kennedy said, why not? Having a mind that can expand its reality or context quickly is an important form of leverage. In fact, it may be your most important form of leverage, especially in this rapidly changing world. 
To Rich Dad, having a mind that could expand its reality quickly was very important. In fact, I believe it was his great personal skill and the reason for his ever-increasing financial success. Now that I am older and hopefully wiser, I more fully appreciate why Rich Dad forbade his son and me from saying, I can't afford it. In the coming years, your ability to change and expand your reality will be your single most important form of leverage. In the coming years, those who can change and expand their context will prosper and move ahead of those who cannot. As the Fast Company magazine says, in the new economy, context is king. If you want to keep up and retire young and retire rich, you will need to be able to continually change your context quickly, because context determines content. And context plus content equals capacity. This more or less completes the ideas on the importance of mental leverage. Although this is the end of the mental reality section, much of this book will refer back to this very important concept of the power of one's reality. The next section of the book is the importance of the leverage of your personal financial plan. The reason having a plan is so important is because most people have dreams, but they fail to have a plan. It is important to have a dream of retiring young and retiring rich, but in order for the dream to come true, a person needs to have a plan to bridge the dream into reality. Your mental leverage will be tested in the next section because we go into dollar amounts that are beyond most people's realities. If the dollar amounts are beyond your reality, or your context, then those dollar amounts will remain only dreams. As stated earlier, it is often difficult for a person who is earning less than $50,000 a year to imagine retiring in a few years with over a million dollars in income. While most people will dream of someday retiring with that much money, less than 1% of the U.S. population will. That reality will forever remain a dream for the other 99%. The good news is that, if you understand the importance of having the right reality or context and understand the importance of having a plan, your chances of retiring young and retiring rich are greatly increased. If you can change your reality and have a strong plan, you may find that making $1 million or more without working can be a lot easier than working all your life for $50,000. All it takes is a flexible reality or context and a plan that is followed. The next section is on creating your plan, a highly leveraged plan to retire young and retire rich. Section 2. The Leverage of Your Plan The following are excerpts from an interview with Robert Reich, Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. The widening gap between the rich and the poor is setting us up for serious trouble. As Secretary of Labor, my goal was to try and get more jobs and better wages for Americans, and after working hard at that role for a number of years, you can't help but feel jobs and wages are everything. But they're not. It's not simply a matter of having a job or even having decent pay anymore. In the new economy, with unpredictable earnings, two tracks are emerging, the fast track and the slow track and the absence of gradations between. The question is, are you and your plan on the fast track or the slow track? Chapter 9 how fast is your plan? I have the need for speed. Tom Cruise in the movie Top Gun The idea of working all your life, saving, and putting money into a retirement account is a very slow plan. It is a good and sensible plan for 90% of the people. But it is not a plan for someone who wants to retire young and retire rich. If you want to retire young and retire rich, you need to have a plan that is far faster than the plans of most people. If you have a chance, see the movie Top Gun and watch the speed at which those young pilots had to fly and make life and death decisions. The capacity to handle speed was important to those young pilots because their lives depended upon the speed at which they handled speed. The same is true in life and business today. The speed at which you can change and expand your context in order to adapt to the changes in the business world today is critical to every one of us who wants to succeed and do well financially. The gap is no longer between the haves and have-nots. Today the gap that is changing the most rapidly is the financial gap between the middle class and the rich. Saying it bluntly, if you have a slow industrial age plan, or context, you are being left behind financially, not by your peers, but by younger people with faster minds and more accelerated ideas. 
This accelerating rate of change of contexts is why we have 25-year-olds who are billionaires and we have 50-year-olds still hoping to find a $50,000 a year job. The sad thing is that many of these same 50-year-old peers of mine are still advising their kids to follow in their footsteps, riding the same slow train their parents rode on. In book number 3, Rich Dad's Guide to Investing, I began with a statement that investing is a plan. I also said that most people plan on being poor, which is why so many people say as my poor dad did, when I retire, my income will go down. In other words, they planned on working hard all their lives only to become poorer. Rich Dad said, if you want to be rich and retire young, you must have a very fast plan that makes you richer and richer with less and less work. How do you create a fast plan? One of Rich Dad's basic tenets on money is, money is an idea. Adding on to this, Rich Dad also said, there are fast ideas and slow ideas, just as there are fast trains and slow trains. When it comes to money, most people are on the slow train, looking out the window watching the fast train pass them by. If you want a faster way to become rich, your plan must include fast ideas. If we were to build a house, most people would first hire an architect, and the architect would work with you to create a set of plans. Yet when these same people begin to build their fortune or plan for the future, most people do not know where to begin, and they never design a financial plan for their lives. There are no blueprints to wealth. When it comes to money, most people follow their parents' financial plan, and that plan is often to work hard and save money. Following that plan, millions of people then sit on the train to and from work and watch the limos, corporate jets, and luxury homes from the window of their train. If you don't plan on spending your life gazing out the window of your train, plane, or car, stuck in rush hour traffic, you may want to begin creating a faster financial plan. The following are some ideas on how to begin to build and develop a faster plan. 1. Choose your exit strategy first. I am often asked, how do I begin investing? Or, what should I invest in? My response to their question is another question, what is your exit strategy? And sometimes, my second question is, how old do you want to be when you exit? My rich dad repeatedly said, a professional investor always has an exit strategy before they invest. Having an exit strategy is an investment fundamental. That is why rich dad also said, always start at the end before you begin. In other words, before you get into investing, you need to first know how, when, where, and with how much you want to exit. For example, if someone came to you and said, what is the first thing you should do before planning a vacation? One answer should be, well, where do you want to go? Or if someone asked you, what should I study? The answer would be, well, what do you want to become after you graduate? The same is true with investing. Before deciding what you should invest in, you should first know where you want to wind up. That is why Rich Dad repeatedly said, knowing your exit strategy is an important investment fundamental. Many people invest because they recognize that the company they work for or the government is not going to take care of them after their working days are over. Many people are investing today for their long-term financial security. While it is good that many more people are investing today, I am afraid many investors did not give much thought to their exit strategy before they began investing. How much will you have when you stop working? A number of years ago, someone gave me the following statistics from the federal government. Although the statistics are a few years old, I do not think the ratios or the dollar amounts have changed much. Using the benchmark of age 65 is when most people plan on retiring or exiting. The question is, how much income do you want when your working days are over? The government tracked people from ages 20 to 65 and found that, by the age of 65, for every 100 people, 36 were dead. 54 were living on government or family support, 5 were still working because they had to. 4 were well off. 1 was wealthy. These statistics appear to verify my earlier statement that most people seem to have a plan on working hard all their lives and retiring poor. 
Either they planned on retiring poor or they did not pay attention to their financial plan or their exit strategy. Looking at these statistics, the question is, when you are age 65, which group do you want or plan to be in when you exit? My poor dad, although highly educated and hardworking, continually went back to institutions of higher learning for more education, and yet still wound up in the group that was at the bottom of the heap at the end of his life. My rich dad, on the other hand, wound up far, far off the chart in the rich category. Although both men more or less started with nothing, they each had a different plan and exit strategy. One planned on retiring poor, and the other planned on retiring rich. Although both men kept working after age 65, the difference was that one had to keep working and the other worked because he enjoyed working. What is the goal of your exit strategy? After looking at the government statistics, I realized that further distinctions needed to be made in order to obtain a more useful chart to determine one's financial exit strategy. Taking these U.S. government statistics, I added further dollar distinctions to those statistics, based upon the year 2000 dollar valuations. Upon retirement at age 65, the income without working falls into these categories. Poor $25,000 or less per year. Middle class $25,000 to $100,000 per year affluent $100,000 to $1 million per year rich $1 million or more per year. Ultra rich $1 million or more a month. The unfortunate reality is that only one out of 100 Americans will reach the affluent level or higher when they exit the workforce. Chances are that 36 out of 100 will be dead, as the government statistics state. These 36 will exit this earth prior to exiting the workforce. That means that 59 out of the 64 people remaining will exit below the affluent level. Only 5 go beyond that level. One reason for this is a slow financial plan without a clearly defined exit strategy. In my investment seminars, I often ask investors, which group do you want to be in once your working days are over? In other words, what is your targeted exit level? I find it interesting that most people are happy to simply wind up in the middle class exit category. I then say, if you are happy there, then keep riding the slow train. The slow train will get you there. I explain further by saying, the slow train follows the schedule of finding a safe job, working hard, living below your means, saving money, and investing for the long term. When I am asked, can I get to the affluent level on the slow train? My answer is, yes, you can get there with a safe, secure, high-paying job, but you must begin investing young, live frugally, invest a large portion of your income, hope that the market does not crash, and be willing to retire after age 55. Explaining further I say, there is a price for using this plan of job security and frugality to reach the affluent level. The price is that it is often difficult to move on to the rich and ultra-rich level using such a conservative plan. If all you want is to retire at the middle class or affluent levels, then you do not need this book. There are many books written for those levels or for people with that context and reality. The middle class level and affluent level are great levels to exit at. But I feel a deep concern for the approximately 50% of the population that will not reach those levels.